So this panel belongs to a series of panels, just to inform you, that uh, the World Artificial Intelligence Conference 2021 is uh, organizing. And the specific topic of this panel will be AI art with the sub subtitle, is AI art a challenge to human creativity? Um, we know that uh, AI art is playing more and more an important uh, role in the art exhibitions all over the world. And I wish to remember uh, the recent exhibitions in uh, UCCA in China and in the Barbican as well. And uh, I wish to inform you that um, in the future, in the recent future, um, we will have um, an AI gallery here in uh, Shanghai. Actually, it will be an AI uh, art center, not really a gallery. Um, but at the same time, as we discussed during the conference uh, uh, on May, AI art raises um, a number of questions involving uh, philosophical um, and not only philosophical, I would say aesthetical, ethical, and social issues. And I would like to discuss with you some of these, some of these, let me close an application here, which is annoying me. Okay. And I would like to discuss some of these issues with all of you. So, um, in particular, as the subtitle of this panel says, I would like to emphasize a comparison between uh, human and artificial creativity. The organization of the panel will be uh, the following. I will introduce myself and then I will start to address some questions to each of you and I will introduce each of you as soon as I will address my, my, my question. So let me introduce myself briefly, not uh, only for you, but as well for the audience of this um, uh, conference. I am a full professor in the College of uh, Design and uh, Innovation, and uh, I am the director of the Sustainable AI Lab. What means sustainable AI? It means uh, AI for the sustainability of this uh, uh, planet, but uh, means uh, as well sustainable AI itself. Means uh, a fair, accountable, and transparent AI. My main interests are respectively machine learning, quantum machine learning, and uh, of course, uh, ethical AI. And uh, I started to be more and more interested in, in the recent times, as well, thanks to Professor Tercidis, which is here, thanks to Costas, to uh, AI applied to art and uh, design. In the past, um, I've been uh, working for IBM Research, for uh, the Gregorian University in Rome, in Italy. I've been teaching there for a number of years. And then I've been the general manager of the Business Innovation Center in Milan and uh, Rome. And now I'm here and I've been working for a number of universities here in China. So let me start with um, the first question. And I would like to address this question to uh, Lev, Lev Manovic. I will introduce Lev in a while. Uh, the question is a question uh, about which he was saying to me, he was thinking during the last weeks or months, or months um, what are the main features of AI creativity? But before, uh, um, before, uh, uh, before uh, allowing him to answer to this question, I would like to introduce Lev. So Lev Manovic is Presidential Professor at the Graduate Center of the Central University in New York, a member of the PhD program in Computer Science, Master Program in Data Science, Master Program in Data Analysis and Visualization, and Master Program in Digital Humanities. He is also the Director of the Cultural Analytics Lab. Uh, this lab has created projects for uh, the Museum of Modern Art, for the New York Public Library, 
for Google and other customers. And he's the author of 15 books. I will mention just some of them. Cultural Analytics, AI Aesthetics, Theories of Software Culture, Instagram and Contemporary Image, Software Takes Command, I like the title. And the recent one is uh, Cultural Analytics, published by MIT Press. So, Lev, what are the main features uh, of AI creativity? And in what respect uh, do they differ from human creativity? So, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I also appreciate that you invited me to speak first, uh, because what I'll do is, you know, if I can take, right, two minutes, is to remind people about the basic historical facts. You know, we think that we live among in a very intelligent society, but I think people in the Middle Ages were much more educated. So you basically have to invite with this Levmanovich, who will tell you what's written in Wikipedia, because nobody reads Wikipedia, right? We should what's written in Wikipedia. So as okay, so we just but to remind you, right? Maybe you don't believe Wikipedia, but if I tell you the same thing, maybe it sounds more convincing, right? So word the concept of art as a creative activity, it's about 200 years old. Right? It's invented the Romantic period. The ancient Greeks and Romans didn't have concept of art. Uh, they didn't have concept of words for creativity. Right? The idea was that there are kind of people who have skills. Um, you know, they have technia. You know, technia leads to contemporary concepts of technology and also kind of techniques. Right? And the painters were considered to be like as basically on the level of slaves, right? So this idea that with art and art can be creative didn't exist. What's interesting is even though this concept is 200 years old, over the last few thousand years, we humans in different civilizations have created the most amazing, the most amazing human expressions, which they recognize as creative without having this concept, which means that it's a fake concept, right? So if we really want to discuss these issues, we should get rid of it. Uh, now, when does this concept appear? So it appears in Renaissance just a little bit. And then uh, for a couple of hundred years, people were wondering, why should we even use the concept of creativity? Because there's only one creator. The God is the creator, and the God is the only kind of being which can create things from scratch. And the artist was maybe considered to be the kind of second type of creativity. And only in the 19th century, only 200 years ago, this idea of modern art, and the idea of creativity came together. And only in the 19th century, people started to think this very strange idea, which today we take for granted, is that the art is the exclusive domain of creativity. Even in the early 20th century, people bring this concept to science, and the scientists start to think about scientific processes creative. So what does it mean? Probably creativity is the wrong concept, because human beings were able to be very creative without it. It's wrong to assume that art has any to do with creativity. It's also wrong to assume that art is a creative domain. I mean, I can prove to you what will take a long time, but I think today pizza making, uh, obviously engineering, science, medicine, you know, hotel designs, or K-pop is way more creative than art. Because just as always, art involves application of rules, application of templates. The difference is that hundreds of years ago, the templates were taught in the academy. So people can knew what they're doing. Now people just copy each other, right? Because of mimicry, because you have so much stuff online. And, uh, but I think that the problem, and I'm finishing here, right? Is that in most our fields, you have some criteria. In science, you have peer review, right? In K-pop, you have you know, audience, audience, you know, who go to concerts. And that's why there's a kind of evolution like processes, which in many cases do allow best people to rise to the top. In arts and humanities, there is no objective criteria. Right? If you look at famous artists today, half of them is good, half of them got there for completely arbitrary reasons. So that's why I think if you really want to have creative AI, if we now take kinds of creativity as it's used in science, uh, as it discussed in creativity studies, a discipline which emerges around 1950, so people study creativity, psychologists, cognitive scientists, and so on for 70 years. So there are lots of different ideas about creativity. Creativity emerges is about creating many different ideas and choosing one. Or creativity is about kind of taking different paradigms, different references, and bringing them together. So creativity is important for science, engineering, and so on. But it's not. But art is a completely relevant topic. 
because art is not creative. Um, so I think that in order for us to make any progress, right, in the creativity, we first have to say, let's forget about the art because art is something else. And let's look at real examples of creativity today, you know, which can be in popular culture, which can be in, like, you know, in, in lifestyle industry, which can be in science, which can be medicine, but it's not art because art hasn't been creative since 1970 because that was the last time when art had a kind of invention of new techniques, right? Installation, performance and land art. And for the last 60 years, art is, is existing in the same paradigm. So this is my controversial, but I think, you know, most of it is, I'm just telling you what's what written in Wikipedia, which is what everybody used to know until 21st century when people got obsessed and fetishized creativity because it came from business competition, right? That's why obsessed with creativity because business needs creativity. Human beings did very well for 3,000 years being creative about having this concept. So something for us to think about. Thank you. So uh, I appreciate the challenge. And by the way, uh, you are uh, talking about a concept which is very close to a concept that um, I was studying for a while. The concept of diamond or the concept of genius. Uh, the concept of a mediator between the one which is really the creator, God, mm -hmm. at times, and the human being, right? But now I would like to hear the opinion of um, Professor Tercidis. So I need to introduce him. I'm sorry about this interruption. So Professor Tercidis is professor in the College of Design and Innovation. It's a colleague of mine at Tongi University. And uh, he's the director of the Shanshan Lab. And previously, he was uh, associate professor at Harvard in the Graduate School of Design and assistant professor at UCLA. His main interests are algorithmic design, and again, as in my case, AI applied to art and design. He's the author of a number of papers and the sole author of four books. Permutation design, algorithms for visual design, algorithmic architecture, and expressive form. So, Costas, what's your opinion hmm. about this subject? I, uh, I, I think I left Britain got exactly at the right point. I think uh, I, I agree with him in many ways. Creativity, I mean, I've been dealing with creativity from two points of view, uh, from a ability to design and to write things with your own hand, which is how I grew up from my family and also from uh, uh, the school of architecture that I studied originally without computers. And then I, went, I got into the computer world and I was completely mesmerized with computers. So I became a completely opposite side of creativity, which is from the, let's say, rational point of view. And uh, what uh, I think creativity as a term today, as Lev said, it probably describes the best of humanity, but at the same time, it describes the worst of humanity, the dark side of humanity, because it makes us feel that we are the only ones who have this ability to be creative. And that is kind of like, in a way, a catch-22 thing. And that is something that needs to be discussed, especially in the concept, in the context of AI, because AI is exactly this moment that we let go of ourselves. And that is something that we cannot do because then, who is going to be the creative person? Who is going to be the, the again, the person who's going to be creative? And, and we don't want to give that to anything that is not a human, or at least looks like a human. And that is, a, 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 in a way, it's a problem. So what we see today in terms of AI creativity, according to what I see, is mostly human creativity that uses AI tools. It's not AI creativity in the sense that a machine is cre creative. No. That somehow we could assign the term creativity to a machine-like system that is not human. We cannot do that. We, we don't even have an example of that today because basically we're looking for something called consciousness, something that's called like human. So if we see something creative, we say, okay, who did it? We never say why and what did it. And that is, again, where the problem is. And with Filippo, that what we're doing here in the School of Design in, in Tongji, which allows us to uh, 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 along a, a wide range of um, um, experimentation is we've been looking into, okay, assume that 
art or creativity is rational, okay? So it's nothing to do but no emotions, no feelings, no intuition, like all gone. Only rational, so it's code. The only thing within the rational world that could be creative is the unexpected. And that is being uh, uh, um, manifested in terms of computational terms with the concept of rational, uh, uh, randomness. So when you have a random thing in a rational process, you get something unexpected. Now, if that unexpected is also creative, not because somebody consciously made it, but because it appears to be creative, then we just declare that maybe that is also creative, like we are too. So that says we're trying to see, okay, what is creative in a rational world with random processes that could also actually compete with a human? And uh, what I found out and what, you know, we've been talking all the time, like endlessly with uh, Filippo, is this idea of permutations, like all the possible combinations of something may hide inside of it something that is creative. And that is exactly where we try to find, that's the hints that we're trying to look into in terms of looking into AI creativity. Again, the true AI creativity, the way that at least I define it, not using a tool to be creative myself, but having a thing, a baby that I create, which is out of myself, which is a machine, a system that actually through random processes and some other techniques becomes creative in a Turing way. I'm sorry, too much talking, but that's my kind of like position again, which I agree completely with a uh, uh, live because again, these are all linguistic terms that have been uh, kind of twisted around the, uh, maybe I would say Renaissance period, maybe the enlightenment period where everything became human. And that is exactly where the problem is, I think. That's again, that's why I agree with him because I think he got, he nailed it right. Exactly. It's a linguistic problem. I think at some point. I would like to hear about the introduction of the notion of randomness that Costas has made, has made just now. I mean, does the notion of randomness really make AI art creative? This is the point. You're asking me, or are you no, bringing no. it to the panel? I'm asking to look. Asking to me? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, so we're thinking about randomness, right? Um, when we're um, designing algorithm, right? Maybe it is a traditional algorithm, or we're uh, you know training uh, a neural network, right? Using supervised machine learning, basically trying to optimize for something, right? And I think, you know, if I can use this really kind of rough term, right? I think if I'm, you know, making a painting or I'm creating some new piece of architecture, maybe I'm thinking about new structure or I'm doing new car design or I'm doing new hotel, I'm trying to optimize something. And optimize means that I don't want randomness, right? I want to explore a probably very really large space of possibilities. And I want to remind you that in fact, uh, in the early 90s, when the kind of media software, you know, like After Effects, Premiere, all the stuff started to come out. During the 90s, the software had a kind of feature, which would, for example, allow you to, you know, generate endless number of different versions of your video edit, but people didn't use it and it went away. And there was a great, great article, which I read recently called, Why Generative Design Kind of Failed, Why People Don't Use This, because it doesn't quite live up to the complexity of kind of human context, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe the technology was simply too slow, which is too slow, right? So what you want, right? You don't want randomness. You kind of want uh, a systematic exploration, right? Of parameters in a very particular area, right? Of possibility space. And I think the trick is to figure out, right? Uh, that this, you don't want this possibility space to be too, too big because otherwise you have millions of possibilities to review but you don't want it to be so small. So how can you write, how can you do it? So maybe you take something from that part of the space, you take something from that part of the space, you bring it together. And I think that despite kind of people thinking about this, right? And we can go back to the, you know, evolutionary programming and so on. I mean, this area is about 30 years old. I don't think people intellectually have really pursued this idea very far yet, right? So we don't want randomness. Uh, we don't want complete determinism, we want exploring the space of endless variations, but how to do it in an interest, how to, how to do it in a creative way. Um, 
uh, and to avoid simply a kind of very raw banal surrealism, which at this point is not interesting. I don't think people have worked on this enough yet, so that's my feeling. Right. Okay, so let's move. We have we have a couple of artists here, so let's move to. I would like to listen their opinion about this topic. So. Let's start from uh, Sofia Crespo. I will introduce Sofia very briefly. So Sofia Crespo defines herself as a neural artist, right? And Sofia is an artist working with a huge interest in biology-inspired technologies. And one of her main focuses is the way organic life uses artificial mechanisms to simulate itself and evolve. This implies the idea that technologies are a biased product of the organic life that created them and not a completely separated object. And this, by the way, reminds me some works from a French philosopher uh, that Costas knows very well, I mean, Bernard Stigler. On the other side, Sophia is also concerned with the dynamic change in the role of the artist working with machine learning techniques. So now we arrive at the point. So we arrive again at the question whether AI art is really creative and in what sense is creative? Yeah, so um, I am 100% willing to challenge the definition of creativity and to say like, okay, we, we can start from saying that creativity is a human construct or that creativity itself doesn't exist. The way that I understand creativity is the recombination of elements to create something new, but with something that was already there. Um, I don't understand creativity as creating something from scratch that didn't exist before. Uh, we're always reusing an element. And the way that I think in the arts, at least it works, is we, we see, we experience life, and through those experiences that we live, we make art. Um, we, we use those things that we were, we were able to perceive through our perceptional uh, capacities as humans and um, and and for that reason I think that something I use very often in my talks is to say that I cannot imagine a color that I've never seen before and that's simply because I haven't seen it I haven't experienced it and that's the very limit of my own imagination and um, and it's also important to divide kind of when we say like rationality and creativity, I don't think they're different things. I think that they're both connected. We can be creative through code. We can be creative through uh, logic. But maybe what we're trying to say is like emotionality. Uh, emotionality and that like is kind of separate to logic in that way. Although we can challenge that as well. Um, but I, I, I don't believe in this kind of separation of the brain between like creative and rational or creativity and logic. And I think that if anything, AI is a product of our own creativity, if we can call it that, um, because we observed patterns in the natural world and then we designed from that an algorithm an algorithm of, or a set of algorithms that can extract patterns from data. And that allows us to make art, but it's still important to, rem to remember that art is, um, is not something that's just by the, by the creator, for the creator. I think there's always somebody who receives the art. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, it exists in culture. And I think uh, we receive it as art. I can make all the art I want, but if nobody recognizes it as art, it can, can it really be called art in society? Um, and this is something that I often think about. I think we humans decide what gets to be called creative, what, what receives that tag and what gets to be called art. It's kind of a societal consensus in a way. Um, 
so <laughs> my to summarize these points of view i would say that i think ai and tools can assist human creativity but they also came from human creativity okay Got i hope that makes sense <laughs> But um, the point that uh, I guess Lev was making is that art itself, besides AI art, is not creative. Right. Lev? Well, you know, uh, I mean, first of all, I want to say that like, I'm not saying anything original. It's basically everybody who is educated should know that. And the fact that people don't know that means we live in the Middle Ages. Right? I'm just basically telling you historical facts. But the concept to art as uh, something which comes from imagination, something which involves inventing new, is about 200 years old, where kinds of creativity comes at the same time. So if you, all the stuff you see in the museums, right? all the stuff, you know, Mona Lisa and Homer, people, didn't, it, people never thought about it as art or creative. They thought about rules, they thought about skills, you know, et cetera, and yet we managed to be creative, so maybe we don't need this concept. So I think creativity, it's a very modernist idea. And uh, yeah, maybe we had kind of modernism. So in the early 20th century, people created all these new things. But we now live in this modernist world, right? You're basically the building which has straight, you know, straight walls, which has no ornaments. We live in a world which was invented between 1905 and 1925. And art hasn't been that creative, I think, since the time. So um, it's trying to be kind of like, you know, and I'm not trying to shock you. I'm actually telling you what I think, right? So, um, so, uh, so what is art today? Uh, you know, where do we find real creativity? Maybe we'll find it in design. You know, so I think when if we want to find examples of creativity in AI, so let's say we have AI, right, who, who is playing chess or playing Go, and if, you know, and it, it creates some kind of moves, right, or strategies which humans have never done, never created. So maybe in this case we can say it's creative. But in order for us to understand how to make creative AI, art, design, etc. We need some evaluation mechanism. And we don't have it, right? So we need to know, again, how do we judge if it's creative or not? And since people can't agree, right, on what's good art, what's bad art, what's good architecture or not, how can we possibly make progress, right? So we need to figure out some kind of criteria, I think, on which we can judge. So how can we judge? Maybe AI is super creative, but we just don't know, right? One thing I just want to say, so, you know, I'm kind of historian of media. Yesterday I found on YouTube, there are all these videos of Photoshop between 19, 2007 and 2012. So every single thing which Adobe today promotes is example of AI, you know, automatic selection of subject, right? Automatic selection of hair. We saw it already existed in 2012. It was all built between 2007 and 2012 without any AI. So if even Adobe constantly gives us hype, you know, it's a very difficult thing. <laughs> Sure. It always, everything we think about is AI and art already existed by 2012 without any machine learning. Strange. I mean, to be honest, uh, even Google Maps is AI. We don't realize that it's AI, but Google Maps is AI. In even what way? Google because of like blend, blend, blending or? Because it's, it makes use of uh, an algorithm which is a very basic AI algorithm called AI Star. I mean, Google okay, okay. AI, a recommendation engine is AI. If you look behind the history of AI, you will find a number of algorithms which yes. nobody recognizes today as AI, but they are That's AI. That's right. Well, I just say one thing very, very briefly. You know, if we're going to say, okay, maybe, by, maybe what we want is machine, which is kind of intelligent, and human and machine creating something together. Think about musical, musical instruments, which are like 5,000 years old. Here, a machine, we right? the tool and the human create something together. So there's no fundamental difference between this and so-called AI today, you know? Yeah. Okay. So let's but, anyway, sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> just, to, just to make everybody angry, but in the productive way. <laughs> but I think there's something really important. There's a fundamental difference between the process uh, of creation. And I think if we don't look at that, then we're just looking at the outcome 
uh, we're saying, okay, so creativity is defined based on, you know, like we're creatives uh, creating sounds. We didn't reinvent the wheel, so this must not be creative. Well, there's actually a completely different engine working behind that's extracting patterns from sounds. And I think that's fascinating. And I think that actually speaks for human creativity, but I'm biased because I'm an AI artist. So what can I say? <laughs> okay. So let's move on because time is running fast. So I would like to hear the opinion of Daniel Ambrosi. I will introduce him very briefly again. So he is based in California. He is recognized as one of the founding creators of the AI art movement. In 2011, Ambrosi, Daniel, devised a unique form of computational photography that generates exceptional immersive landscape images and more recently his own series called dreamscapes built upon his previous experiments by adding an enhanced version of deep dream what is deep dream for the audience it's a computer vision program evolved from google's desire to visualize the inner workings of deep learning ai models so daniel uh, what's your opinion about the subject well, first of all, I want to thank Lev for that historical context uh, that I hadn't really been aware of before and um, provocative take on creativity. I would say my definition of creativity is perhaps a bit looser. Um, I really enjoyed the book, The Runaway Species, How Human Creativity Remakes the World by David Eagleman, where he basically explains that uh, kind of like what Sophia was saying, that creativity is incremental. It comes from bending, breaking, and blending existing things. Um, and in my view, what uh, enables you to sort of define something as creative when it goes to the next level is, does it seem that that new move has brought significant originality of vision or commentary or concept? If so, then I think maybe we can call that as verging on creativity, even when it comes from a machine. Um, I do want to also respond quickly to what Sophia said about who gets to say who an artist is. It just reminds me uh, of John Waters, the famous cult film director who's since developed quite the fine art career in New York City and whatnot. Um, on a documentary, uh, he was saying, oh, yeah, it's, it's funny when people come up to me and say, I'm an artist too. What I think to myself is, why don't we let history decide that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so who gets to say? Um, but, uh, you know, I'd like to hit this on on uh, both the general uh, level that I just talked about in terms of what creativity is and more specifically about what I'm up to because one thing that you'll see about AI art, you can't group it all together. I've sat on a number of panels with folks like Sophia before and the range of what these AI artists are doing are all over the map from uh, wholly generated code-based uh, AI graphics uh, to more human AI um, uh, you know, hybrid work. I, I put myself kind of on that end of the spectrum and there's everything in between. Um, so when I talk about my view of in what way my AI is creative, it's very specific to what I'm doing. So please keep that in mind. Um, now, remember my uh, artwork is a combination of computational photography and AI. It starts with a camera. It starts with a real world location. And when I started using Deep Dream on these uh, giant landscapes, um, what was really shocking was it appeared, even though I know it's not sentient, that uh, my version of Deep Dream was seeing the world in a manner that's related to how humans see it, but it's different. And when I first created these sort of full scene dreamscapes where those effects were quite detailed, so from a distance, I, I would print these things out as very large life boxes, eight feet high by 16 feet wide. And from a distance, they just appeared to be completely photographic. And when you got close to them, you noticed that they were nothing like what you thought they were. Um, and that, you know, uh, I think jars people and makes them start to think about larger subjects, like what is the nature of reality? What is the truth about seeing the, ph the phenomenon of seeing itself? Um, the other thing, so I think one, one of the things about AI creativity for me is that my AI sees the world in, the, in a different way that I do, even though we kind of can connect to it. You know, it's like 
people doing hallucinatory drugs or the phenomenon of pareidolia where you see shapes in clouds and the man on the moon. Uh, it's kind of similar, but it's different. Um, the other big thing that I, I think makes it semi-creative or verging on creativity is it's contextual. Um, I can control the direction my AI takes, but I, but I can't control the details. You know, there's 84 layers of Deep Dream's neural network, um, which accounts for roughly 84 different motifs or dreaming looks. But how these looks are applied are determined by the content upon which it's operating. It's contextual in that regard, which leads to unpredictability. That's not sheer randomness. It's actually it's actually seeing the world uh, and, and, and operating on it and giving me its thoughts. Um, so I guess a key way to wrap this up is ultimately uh, to call it uh, art or to make it worth publishing requires curation by a human. Uh, even the, the fully generated stuff from like um, Ahmed El Gamal at Rutgers uh, with the, you know, AI, um, creative adversarial networks that's like completely generated there's extensive curating going on there and fortunately some of those curators have really good taste and i've been to some of uh ahmad's shows he had the first ai art show in a, in a real gallery in new york city and it was fantastic there was just great stuff in there completely machine generated um so that's kind of where i'm coming from with this whole notion of ai creativity okay Thanks, uh, Daniel. So, Costas, mm -hmm. I have a question to you. Uh, would you say that the only art which is really creative, at least from your point of view, is just AI art? Well. I'm trying, I'm trying to, to mix up some ideas coming from Lev with some ideas coming from you. I would like to hear your opinion. Well, the creativity that we're talking about has uh, two different uh, uh, schizophrenic views. One is uh, the one that comes from the human, which, of course, everything that we've said so far makes sense. A human has to be the one who controls everything. The woman, the human is the one who curates. Humans are, in a way, the ones who uh, recombine things, reuse things, define the world. It always has to come from a human. That's the one point of view which of course, again, according to the definition of creativity, which is a human kind of privilege, yes. But if you take the uh, left's point of view, which is creativity is not something that we invent. It's something that we discover. It exists already in the world. It's something, something which can happen, but as a byproduct of very different goals we have, you know? Exactly. Exactly. You know? Right. Like, right? In our, in our you know, Leonardo, or ancient, sorry, or ancient Greek, or Rembrandt, we never said, I'm going to be creative now. Maybe like, you know, solving problems, you know, trying to talk to God, representing nobility, and, and we just happened to invent something amazing, but it was never a goal. So maybe by putting it as a goal, we're kind of going in the wrong direction. Sorry, sorry, Costas, just, hey, it's okay. just footnote, footnote, you know. You're just reinforcing my point that uh, yeah, the okay. idea of, uh, that, that, that there is a uh, concept of um, um, intellectuality that is beyond the human. It's not inside of us, it's outside. So in that sense, that's why I use the word uh, uh, discover as opposed to uh, invent, because invent is associated with us being in control of that versus discover, which is more like it's a world. Like, uh, for example, the uh, continent of America existed before, we just didn't know that. So then we looked around and then we found it. In that sense, intel intelligence exists outside of us, we're just looking to find it. In that sense, creativity is a little bit different. It's not what I make out of it, it's what I discover, what I found. So you can look at the deep dreams or you can look at all these uh, AI or even randomness itself as a outside of ourself system that we're trying to find similarities with us. So in that sense, we're reflecting ourselves into something that is a copy of ourselves, but it's a different one. It's a what we call an alien sort of like uh, um, um, intelligence which I call AI. In that sense, it's a different creativity. Again, it's a, we said before, a linguistic sort of, a, which comes again, as Lev said, come from this um, um, focus shift through historical sort of evolution where the focus was on God or on something that was outside of myself, on the uh, 
on the nature, which is not me. And I'm trying to find things out of that versus somewhere around the Enlightenment period or like the 19th century, the 20th century, where everything come to us. We are the ones. We are the most important things. We just know everything. And we just have to find, and we have to solve the problems of the world. So that's kind of like the shift, again, that existed. And I think that is a little bit of a, uh, a problem in the uh, interpretation phase. The that you make between uh, discovering and inventing is a very platonic concept. I mean, discovery. It is, it is. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I am Greek. Yeah, I am Greek, and I mean, that is something that is embedded into our DNA, that there is a uh, world outside of us that is to be discovered, and, you know, we are the ones who have to uh, search for it, uh, as opposed to, like, we are the ones who are going to tell to the world what we think. Two different things. Your point is uh, an ontological concept. The point that you're yeah, an ontological concept. I guess that the concept that Lev is making is a cultural concept, if I'm not, a, if I'm not wrong. Correct, Lev? Okay, so... Not Greek, but are you, are you Aristotle, are you for Aristotle or for Plato? Because they're pretty different, right? So Aristotle yeah. says we have to discover things through experiments. Plato says the stuff is already there and they actually discover. So anyway, but Alina didn't speak yet, so I'm waiting. I think she kind of, she's going to like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm uh, uh, she's going to show, show with, we're, we're all children just playing in the kind of the platonic shadows <laughs> and we, we still have, don't know civil rights, so please. So Alina, it's your time. So let me introduce Alina. Alina Constantin, by the way, was introduced to me by Mona Sloan. Um, it was a preacher. She already attended that our AI art conference. She's a graduate in master in game design at New York University Game Center. Her background moves from animation to games, teaching, and hands-on environmental work. Alina, very interesting enough, has designed and organized live play experiences for climate awareness in youth community centers between Southern and Northern Europe, and released recently in 2018, her own awarded game, Shrug Island on Steam. So what's your opinion, Alina, about all this discussion? Well, uh, thank you so much for having me and for um, actually bringing me at this point in the discussion because I think there's a lot of different points here that merge very, very nicely, both from the uh, Lev's introduction, uh, Sophia's discussion about process, uh, uh, questions about the reflection and the truth of seeing. I really, my, um, my perspective is that uh, a lot of the questions that we're tackling here are a mixture of ontological and cultural. So we could say that they are a lot based on the definitions that we apply to things. Um, in my uh, past year of studying AI, um, I've been making uh, art about AI rather than AI art and sort of deconstructing the linguistic concepts of AI as human and interpersonal concepts as social grammar. Um, and what I'm interested in, uh, in, in breaking apart here is that um, uh, in the same way that Lev was talking about, uh, 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 art has been created without the concept. AI exists without the name. The name changed in uh, 1986, which is the year when I was born. There was a very interesting piece of writing um, uh, that was closer to political in which uh, the, the, the terminology at that point was self-reproducing self automata was a, a closer term. Um, Bring, bringing us closer to Marxist theory and to the theory of labor. I think what I'm interested in, in looking at here in talking about EA creativity is um, who is interpreting uh, creativity and what does it serve? Where does it come from? So in terms of uh, the authorship of that creativity, we cannot distance ourselves, even if AI by definition is a distanciation. And it's a very interesting way of seeing how can we look at uh, an individualized concept of priorities, of human priorities, generating patterns or uh, assessing uh, what will be put forth, what will be kept. How can, how can that distanciation um, also 
bring a lens as to what we prioritize um, and and what does it mean about ourselves and so I think uh, it, it is impossible to distinguish AI from the human it is impossible to distinguish creativity from the judge that says it is creative from the interpreter um, and in that way I think AI is a very interesting um, cultural tool that that brings together the mimic and the judge and the generator and I think what's very important moving forth is to look at um, a transparency of that procedure, a transparency of what is inside this process. Um, and what does that have to say about what we do moving forward as a species, actually? Very good. Can, can I just add something? Uh, because you provoke some great, and I was also thinking about Sophia when you said it correctly, but today instrument, we don't just play it, but instrument can like observe our patterns, right? So, you know, I was thinking about this issue, right? Who decides what's creative? So, you know, if I show some image to somebody who never met a museum, person say, what's well, super creative, right? If you show this image to me, who was trained in art at the age of 13, and who started doing art in 1984 at NYU, I would say, this is a piece of shit because I've seen this millions of times. So now I imagine this AI, which learned every single image, every single sound, every single design which humans created, right? Which actually has complete knowledge of all human cultural history, VCI actually would be much better judge of something is creative than any of us. Right? So this would be one thing where I think, like, you know, we can, we can have a creative judging because VCI will learn, right, more about kind of human, human uh, creativity in history than any of us, right? So that would be an interesting thing to potentially get AI to do. You know? I think that Costas could add something because I know that this concept that you express is very close to some concepts that he's trying to defend, even with me sometimes. I'm not even sure if we need to uh, appreciate something that is obvious. Sometimes, uh, you know, you don't need the interpreter anymore, uh, especially when it has to do with things that are not subjective, that are objective. When you, for example, uh, math, do we need somebody to interpret it? Do we need somebody to tell us, oh, this is good or bad math? It is. It is what it is. It's an objective reality. It's something that exists. In the same way AI also exists in this world, like you said before, we're discovering. So in other words, as I said before, the continent of America, as we found it, we don't need somebody to tell us if it's good or bad. We don't need somebody to explain to us what we saw. It's there. It is a thing. That's the difference between what we're talking from the beginning, the subjectivity of um, art versus the objectivity of um, AI, which is a little bit more uh, um, 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 obvious, if you like. Uh, it's the awe we get when we see something that is intelligent, but it's not coming from us. It's the uh, surprise, if you like. It's the beauty that you see in the tool that you are uh, using. Uh, that is a little bit different from our dependency on somebody or some critic or some person to tell us what is or what is not nice. Uh, that's more aesthetics versus art which is a little bit two different things in a, in, in, in a kind of like, again, from my Greek point of view. Okay. So we have just uh, a few minutes before concluding this panel, because we must stay within uh, 60 minutes. So I would like to ask a question again to Alina. So uh, my question is, what can AI art teach to AI ethics, because there are a number of uh, artists which are working on this side of the problem. And uh, I can mention, for instance, one which I like particularly, which is Stephanie Dickens. So I would like to know your opinion about this topic. Um, I think it's a, it's a very good topic to, to close off with because um, when we're talking about ethics, we're talking about uh, who's involved. Um, we're talking also about what, what perspectives are, um, are present. And I think um, what AI art can bring in, in, in a lot of other ways that AI brings things is perspective. Uh, if, if done properly, I think it's, um, AI is a power tool. So it, it, the, the question that AI art can bring is who is, 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 reflecting to us who is driving these patterns and who is driving the 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 systems and the, and the processes and the productions that we see 
um, I think it's a very important uh, uh, concern in AI ethics as well, is like what systems of power here are prioritized and reproduced? Who is present in that system, in that architecture, in that, in, in that structure, and who is not, and why? Um, and I think um, how can a, a, a reproducing structure uh, acknowledge that and, and acknowledge, uh, okay, why well, this is why we have chosen this particular model to, um, to generate something here. What, what does that have to say about us really? Um, and I think in, in that way, I'm interested in how it actually questions us in the same way that Lev questioned us, our, our initial definitions to, to begin with. How can we uh, question um, who, who owns and who, uh, who is used by, um, by the productions of our culture? Yeah. Because I think that uh, one main problem of AI is that uh, here I don't agree with Costas, at least when we speak about neural networks. I mean, we are speaking about something which is in some way predefined by humans. We are talking, for instance, about selecting a, a training sample. We are talking about annotating a training sample, annotating each sample of the training sample and so on. So uh, the, 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 the point that you made just now, I think is quite important from an ethical point of view, but I would like to hear as well uh, the answers from the other two artists we have here, which are uh, Sophia and Daniel. Sophia, what's your opinion? That uh, AI art can be used to raise, uh, to, to use like as a source of expression, uh, to raise questions in society freely, you know, like we can take uh, a data set, we can expose a bias that happens and we can use it to inform ethics and to, yeah, to start to, to use it as a conversational tool. Uh, at least it, through my work, that's how I try to use it. Uh, in particularly, like my topic is nature. At least I try like to, uh, to use AI to start the conversation about nature and how, how we exist in relationship to the natural world. But I think there is lots that we can do through culture in general to inform the ethics of technologies. So, but uh, in your work, uh, you are particularly interested in uh, emphasizing these aspects or not? Because it doesn't seem to me so much. I mean, it seems that you are very, very far from an artist like I uh, was mentioning before, Stephanie Dickens. Yes, uh, so my work attempts at talking about re our own relationship with the natural world and the topic of representation as well, how we represent the non-human in AI and how we look at the natural world, um, how, how we make aesthetical, aesthetic preferences and how we are biased towards certain creatures. Uh, we feel more empathy towards uh, animals that have eyes, like big uh, round eyes and that can look back at us, but we don't feel that kind of same empathy towards creatures that don't have that, that are invertebrate, that are, uh, for example, like a jellyfish. Um, so uh, it doesn't directly, my, my, maybe my work doesn't open the, the same kind of ethical questions that Stephanie's work does, which I love, by the way. Uh, but it goes, it tackles it from a, from a different kind of way. Um, Daniel, what, what's your... Yeah, my answer would... Please, please. Go. Yeah, my answer would be very similar to Sophia's uh, because we're both really kind of looking at nature and mm -hmm. and um, and so on. And I'm not an expert in the area of AI ethics. There's many other people, and in fact, entire institutions like the Institute for Human Centered AI at Stanford, where that's something they really focus on. Um, but again, I'm going to have to get specific about what I'm doing. To me, um, the question is. Can AI help humans be more ethical? Because we're not talking about can the AI be more ethical? 
uh, we don't have a sentient AI and we're not going to for a long time in my opinion. Uh, so the question is, can working with an AI make humans more ethical? And per what Sophia said, um, for me, seeing an alien way of looking at the real world uh, has opened my mind and, and helped me consider alternate points of view. And I think that's an important aspect of being ethical. You know, my work with AI has reinforced the value of this. AI, AI art for me can be a metaphor for empathy. And in my opinion, empathy is critically important to ethics. Lev, can AI help humans to be more ethical? Question to you. Um. So, you know, the ethics, right? It's a very complex question with the philosophy, psychology, and so on. Uh, but I think the reason, we, I mean, here's my like very particular take on it, right? Very idiosyncratic. I think the human, traditional human cultures, right? We had ethics because ultimately you were responsible to God, right? So God was watching over you, and, you know? And that's why the concept of ethics, but also honor, right? Was very important, right? In many ancient cultures, life was not important right i mean it was better to die in some situations than to live because maybe choosing death was more honorable right very different from today right and then like you say she you know right Nietzsche says you know the god is dead right so slowly we have you know god becoming less and less important and what comes instead is you know money creativity you know power the century right communism which kills 500 million people and so on and so forth um, so, uh, what can AI can do, right? Uh, maybe if AI becomes a new god, perhaps it can make it new ethical, it can happen in our lifetime. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking, but I'm kind of serious, right? I'm so serious, you yeah. know? Well, Costas AI is a kind of new god. So, Costas, can AI help uh, humans to be more ethical? And from what? Yeah. <laughs> I, I tend to um, be, uh, usually when the com subject comes to ethics, I tend to uh, represent as my client the uh, underrepresented uh, um, uh, uh, entity, which I call the alien, the thing, the new type of um, um, baby that is being born right now as a uh, uh, intellectual, uh, uh, um, again, entity. Because uh, when we look into artists and when you actually make something and you realize that it's not me who made it, it's something that I was surprised by my own creation, it means that something else is going on. It means that I am not in control of my intellectual process, which means something else is happening in the process between me making something and something that comes out of me. And that something else, I don't want to ethically uh, um, um, uh, kind of like uh, adopted as its mind because I'm the only one in the room when this was created. But I tend to think that there may be something else starting to be born at this moment where I'm just actually touching a new entity. Again, I don't want to use the word God, but it's some sort of a intellectual entity that exists right now out of me and I'm just getting in touch of it. So when, I, again, I talk about AI, I try to be the advocate. I try to represent my client as being somebody who is not from this world. So, for example, when there is a art or some, some, something that has been created that is beautiful, and yet I cannot explain who made it, I tend to try to be the one who is representing this new author. And that's why we use the term in our conference, what is the author, as opposed to who is the author, to avoid this sort of like anthropomorphic, like the two eyes, or even the uh, um, natural or animalistic kind of like uh, uh, association we have with creativity, and try to put it into the more intellectual sphere where things could exist that have a uh, ability to do things. And these we have to represent. There, somebody has to talk about these things, these alien creatures that were this alien entity, which we now today call use the word ai so that's kind of like a, I, I guess it's a little bit too probably science fiction but it is in a way science fiction i mean in a true sense of the of the term science fiction and again it's coming back 
It always existed. It's just now we have more access to it that we didn't have before. We called it in the past uh, animism, like uh, things that are, you know, we give a, a, a life to, spiritualism, we called it a religion, we called it a science at some point, but it's always this other thing that we're trying to uh, encounter. And uh, today we have this ability through the technology to get in touch with it. So again, I would be the uh, ethical uh, lawyer for that sort of uh, representation of my alien uh, client. Last question and then we need to close. So very quickly, creativity is in the process or in the result? Sophia, you mentioned this point at the very beginning. <laughs> Right, I think uh, both. I think definitely both. Um, yeah, like we see, we tag something as creative, but then also we, we the way we recombine, the way we do it, yeah, the process itself is relevant. Um, so you think? Yeah. Creativity yeah. is both. Both. The process and the When you think about yeah. it, you think about the cognitive process. You think about the cognitive process, the individual cognitive process. Yeah. This is what you're thinking yeah. about. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Exactly. Thanks. Daniel, what's your point of view? Yeah, like I said earlier, um, you know, my AI is contextual. It's actually operating on what it's looking at which is one thing that wonderfully makes it different from a standard photoshop filter it, it, it's actually an, an intelligent brush stroke which is really how i'm mainly using it you know uh it's uh it's just a way for me to almost do an impressionism uh you know with, with a, a set of brush strokes that i'm really fond of um the last time we talked uh Kostas mentioned it sometimes looked a little repetitive that is because of the 84 layers, I only, the 48 of them at least are too grotesque, even for my liberal tastes. Um, so it's a, it's a limited repertoire, but um, you know, it's doing it in such an intelligent way. I think that's new. So that brings some creativity to it. I am very results focused. Um, you know, I work really hard to do finished pieces that I fuss over that can speak for themselves. And I shouldn't have to explain the process for someone to really um, see it as as a creative piece or something that they like, um, so I hope that doesn't sound too wishy-washy. <laughs> like Sophia, I kind of see it both ways. There's creativity in both the result and the process. Alina, your opinion? Uh, my opinion is that uh, creativity is in the interstitial, is in the in between, uh, and it's in between not only the process and the result, but largely the um, the agents involved in the space. So the agents can be the creators and can be the perceivers. Um, I think uh, creativity is a, a result of, uh, of, of, of a larger experience. Um, and that's not only in the production and in the process of production or in the result of production, but it is also in the uh, perception of, of said production. And, and, and it, it really stems from, um, uh, the combination of uh, perceptions in a space. So basically you are introducing a social aspect. Yes. Okay. So Lev, your opinion? Process? I think you know, yeah, so based both on my knowledge of cultural historian, but also my own work in visual arts since the age of 13, I first was training. I think you can have very creative process, amazing process, you can have very banal result. And you can probably have any mechanical process and maybe make a creative result. But I want to also add something else. Here is the most creative, the most magical object, most magical work of art I've encountered in the last five years. It's this, right? You know, a report. It's magic. So can we ever hope for the AI to be creative if it doesn't have a human body? Can you separate form and content? Right? That's the question asked by Herbert Dreyfus. In 1972, what computers can do, can we build an intelligent, right, intelligent entity with, which has intelligence without a body? And I'm still wondering. Right? So that's also to me is a question. You can have you can have a very creative process, but if I only create symbols which are not connected to a bodily experience, 
it may never be able to create something like this, you know. I totally agree with you. I mean, you mentioned one of my preferred yeah. uncles, which is exactly Hubert Dreyfus. Yeah, we should never forget that we are embodied at the very end and embedded. Uh, Costas, I think you have a different opinion. Yeah, I have to be consistent with myself. So I would say that it's the result, definitely the result. Uh, and again, I put it in the context of process result as the verb versus the noun. And um, the verb has a problem because it always requires the actor, the person, the thing that creates it, whereas the noun is there. It just doesn't need to have a uh, creator. And that's very important. Again, uh, um, I have been switching from the, um, I was in uh, 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 America and in Harvard, and then I moved, you know, I'm Greek, and then I moved to China. And in China, I encountered this idea of the noun, the thing. Again, if you look into the language of Chinese, which I'm learning right now, it's all about things. It's not about how it's been made. It's the thing, 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 it's all nouns. And you try to connect things together in that sort of context. And I think that's a beautiful way of looking at things because it liberates you from this, uh, burden of who am I and what, who are you and how do we interact in order to verb things out, to make things out. It just basically makes things exist the way they are. And always to make your point, especially in China, you make it, you do it. You don't argue your case, you do it. And by doing it, making the noun, then you're called creative. And that exactly is, I think, liberating to me because I don't have to anymore argue my case. I just do it. And then we just basically, you put yours, you put my, uh, theirs, and we all start to uh, merge our nouns in this world. So that, in a sense, is what we call creativity in this part of the world. But the point that Alina was making, and then we close, is that uh, it's not me, it's us. So it's uh, an introspective experience. This was her point, I guess. Anyway, we must close because we are behind the, the limits of our time. So I wish to thank all of you again. Uh, I guess it will not be the last time we will be together discussing these topics. Many questions have not been answered because I prepared a long list of questions. And then at the very end, it's your fault, Lev. Because at the very end, we asked <laughs> basically just one question, because you were very provocative from the beginning, and I appreciate it, by the way. So, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry for what? It was a very important contribution. And uh, I hope that uh, one day we will be able to meet face to face, all together, and uh, to have uh, a less formal uh, and less virtual, uh, a very embodied discussion between all of us, because it's always very enriching. Thanks to all of you. And uh, I want to thank you I, that uh, thank you. you're very welcome. I want to specify that uh, this panel will be published um, during the three days of the World Artificial Intelligence Conference, and this panel will be published on YouTube as well. Uh, it will be edited by a team uh, working for uh, the World Artificial Intelligence Conference, and therefore there will be maybe some change, but not so much. So thank you very much, and uh, see you soon again. Bye, 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 bye. Thank you, everyone. That was great. Bye, bye Daniel. Bye. Thank everyone. you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.